Um, thank you very much for giving me this great opportunity to talk about my work on microphysi microphysiological modeling of a disease, a neuromuscular disease called Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, and the modeling mouse neuromuscular junction. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, three different uh, uh, things here. One is neuromuscular junction. It is a junction between nerve and the muscle, and we are uh, interested in the uh, presynaptic side uh, of this uh, neuromuscular junction. It is a reliable um, transmitter, re transmitter release machinery, and the, which is made from smaller, unreliable um, like units, and each of these units composed of one vesicle and just a few, like uh, uh, very few um, calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels, which are um, associated with that vesicle. Uh, I can show you a better picture in the next um, slide. So I'm going to also talk about Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. It is a very rare disease. It's a uh, muscle weakness. It's some kind of muscle weakness. It's uh, caused by an um, autoimmune, like it's an autoimmune disease. It's, uh, people think that it's caused by uh, autoantibody to the VGCCs, which is voltage-gated calcium channels. But um, the thing is that only 85% of the patients have the, these uh, uh, autoantibodies to the VGCCs. We call them uh, seropositive. Uh, the rest of them, like 15% uh, of them, don't actually have any uh, autoantibody. So uh, we wanted to model this disease. Uh, so we use a modeling a tool, we call it, uh, like uh, the name is M-cell, it stands for Monte Carlo cell, it's some kind of uh, reaction diffusion tool, I mean calculation and calculation of reaction diffusion, and it's real, like you can realistically model your system, you can, um, like in the next uh, slide I will show you how we do that. And uh, using this tool, uh, we uh, were able to uh, model these active zones and the, uh, the disease, Lem's disease, which is caused by disruption of the active zones and losing some of these uh, proteins located in the active zones. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have seropositive and seronegative Lem's uh, patients in seropositives. Uh, there are definitely loss of calcium channels in the system, but in seronegative, we don't see that. But in all of the patients, uh, it is detected that um, there are some anti antibodies, like to some proteins, uh, like some um, uh, transmembrane proteins. But uh, so uh, it is like uh, people usually talk about, when people usually talk about LEMS, they think that it's only uh, about losing the calcium channels. So, and in, the, uh, in this figure in A, I'm not sure how you can see it. In figure A, you can see a pretzel form, which is neuromuscular junction So here you see the neuromuscular junction um, of mouse, and you see green dots and red dots. Green dots are presynaptic side, um, and the red dots are the postsynaptic uh, side of this, and the uh, postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. So uh, we focus it, like if you focus on it, you can uh, just see a little better here. But uh, this figure shows the uh, freeze fracture, uh, which is, I mean, all these experiments are done uh, by my colleague, Dr. Steve Marini uh, uh, the, from uh, University of Pittsburgh. So in this picture, you see the placeholder, like two placeholders for the uh, vesicles, the big circles. And if you see those two rows in each side of the vesicles, 
these are like these dots are uh, different proteins located in the uh, in this area, like in, this, in two sides of the vesicle. But we don't know which one of these are calcium channels. So um, we uh, recently published a paper and we just uh, did the parameter sweep and found that these uh, four calcium channels around the, um, the vesicles which uh, could just give us the best results for uh, when we compare it with the experiment. So, if you look at the top formula here, this is the rate of closing and opening of the calcium channels. These alpha and beta are uh, forward and backward rates. All of them, if you look at them, they are voltage dependent. So therefore, they are time dependent. So if you have a, an action potential going to your system, you can easily calculate alpha and beta and therefore the forward and backward reaction. We have three closed states and two open states. I can explain it later if I have time, which I don't think I have. Uh, so, if you look at this one, it's our uh, M-cell uh, box. We put six active zones here, and uh, like each, each of these active zones uh, contain two vesicles and four uh, channels in uh, two sides of the vesicle. So it's because of we wanted to save time, like with one simulation, you can have results of six of them. And the distance between them are taken from the experiment. Here you see in the, like, uh, the bottom of the vesicle, uh, there are some like colorful things here. They are synaptotagmin one. And uh, this green one, which is located around the vesicle a little bit far from the center, like bottom center, they are synaptotagmin 7. We know many things about synaptotagmin 1, but almost nothing about synaptotagmin 7. We don't know how many of them is in the, uh, located uh, in the bottom of the vesicle, or maybe somewhere else, we don't know. Uh, but we know about this uh, number of synaptotagmin 1, which is 6. Synaptotagmin 1 uh, is fast and synchronous, uh, calcium binding uh, proteins, so they bind fast and unbind fast, so uh, it's synchronous as soon as the action potential comes. Uh, so calcium released to the system, some of them bind to these, uh, to these synaptotagmin ones and it's synchronously released the uh, neurotransmitter. But the other ones, the ones that, which are around, they are slower and asynchronous. So these synaptotagmin 7s, uh, it takes some time to just uh, bind to the, um, to the um, calcium and it, when they bind, it's, it takes more time to release it. So uh, then um, our M-cell model, uh, using this uh, modeling, uh, we have a 3D mesh uh, of the, the base of the M-cell, like, yeah, sorry, uh, base of the normuscular junction active zones, and we have all the calcium channels, and we have millions of buffer in the system, calciums, uh, after the action potential can come to the system and bind to the buffers and unbind and finally get to the vesicle bottom, and uh, so, our M cell was um, successful to predict the uh, average of uh, vesicle release and also fourth order calcium release. It is uh, like the, uh, by changing the external calcium concentration, you have more and more calcium release. And uh, yeah, and facilitation. Oh my God. <laughs> so uh, yeah. What we did in these simulations, uh, we first removed some VGCC, some uh, uh, calcium ions, um, sorry, calcium channels from the system because we wanted to uh, compare seropositive versus seronegative. So the seropositive, as you remember, they uh, lose some of the calcium channels. Then we run the simulation. And I forgot to mention that M-cell, you should run it for several times, like 6,000 times in this case, because you have to gather enough data and to have a good average of the, um, uh, and have a good uh, analysis and good average for this, comparing to a real neuromuscular junction, which co uh, contains more than 700 to 1,000 uh, active zones. So um, if we, remove these channels and we run the simulation, we see the technique potentiation here 
if you look at this, this is our uh, control uh, M cell, one of these, the red one, uh, is a, a simulation. This one is an um, experiment which are pretty close, but if you compare it with the LEMS disease, LEMS shows a high technique potentiation, which we couldn't recover by removing this channel. We couldn't uh, find this uh, LEMS uh, prediction. So I should go fast, I guess. So then we move the channels away because we know that the uh, channel disrupt, disruption also causes this problem. By removing, the, by moving channels away from the original position, we can recover a little bit of this facilitation. Then we combine all of these, like moving channel, removing channel, and we know that some of the active zones are actually lost in the system. So if we combine all of them, we see that we recover just a little bit of the facilitation, but not enough. And this area, the uh, probability of release is pretty close to the experiment. So then we started removing synaptotagmines. So some of these synaptotagmines we removed, um, um, for example, here we removed between one to five of these six synaptotagmines, and we see that it can recover this uh, facilitation a little better. Then when we combine all of these effects, let me go to the last one, combine all of these effects, like removing some of the active zones, removing some of the channel, removing the rem rem remainder of them, and uh, plus adding the L-type channel, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which, should, uh, which happens in the uh, Lens disease, we could recover uh, the whole uh, facilitation. So there are several different uh, scenarios which can go here, like between one to three uh, synaptic timing could be, could be removed in this scenario and it can recover the facilitation. And these different systems can show also the good um, transmission release compared to experiments. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for listening to this call, uh, to this uh, talk, and uh, yeah, sorry, it was a little bit rushed. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we are um, this time we are uh, working on the two different drugs which can, um, which can cure. I mean, which can uh, recover a little bit of uh, the effects of the Lems disease. One is DAP, the other GB58. Hopefully, in the next CRCNS meeting, I will uh, explain some of these uh, drugs. Thank you very much.